Hi, I'm Jay Fallon, and thank you for listening to The Slippery Slope. Uh, listen, today I'm going to have Pastor Patrick Russell on the program. Um, also, if you are watching this program on YouTube, I would ask that you would please like and subscribe. If you hit the like button too, it's very important, apparently. Also, I thank you for listening on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts and all those places. Please, again, like um, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Uh, I really appreciate it. So as today, like I said, I'm going to have uh, Pastor Patrick Russell on the show in a second. Here we go. Pastor Patrick, how are you? Yeah, very good, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I'll... <laughs> Thanks for joining me again on the Slippery Slope. Uh, is everything going okay? Everything's going really well. Okay. Um, I'd, physically I'd seen, and spiritually, it's all good. It's all good? Okay. Listen, I'd, um, I'd seen there's a lot of things happening, uh, which I thought was of relevance in Israel, as far as Israel is concerned. But I just wanted to get uh, your thoughts on that and what you, how you thought, um, or any news stories that you thought were probably of biblical or Bible prophecy importance and how you thought things were, uh, yeah, just discuss Israel in general and um, and anything else that's, that's happening with uh, Christian friends of Israel and things like that. Yeah, look, um, I think the... Um main thing at the moment is the uh, threat from Iran. Uh, there's a lot of talk in Israel at the moment because um, it, it seems like Iran is trying to create a ring of, ring of fire, as it were, around Israel. Yep. They're using their proxies. Uh, for example, in Lebanon, Lebanon's basically run by Hezbollah, which is a proxy or an army supplied and financed from Iran. And so that's in the north of Israel, uh, Hezbollah, and they've got over 150,000 rockets ready to fire into Israel. And these aren't, um, you know, little backyard rockets. These are rockets that can reach any part of Israel. So you've got that threat in the north. And then in the south, you've got um, in the Gaza Strip, you've got Hamas, which is also a proxy of Iran. And they're being armed by Iran. And as you've seen recently, there's been a a bit of rocket fire going on there, and Israel's been taking out their rocket sites. Yeah. So yeah. in the south, they've got people there, and then you've got Iran itself proper. You've got Syria. Um, Israel continues to bomb sites in Syria, trying to take out um, Iranian-supplied weapons. So it's like Iran is trying to build a circle around uh, Israel, and they're getting ready, Israel believes, to attack Israel on multiple fronts, from the north, from the south, from the east. Uh, all at once because, you know, that'll overwhelm their defence systems because those Iron Dome rockets are, are very good, but they can only, um, you know, last so long. And so it's believed that Iran is trying to overwhelm Israel and getting ready to attack on multiple fronts. So that's the big news at the moment in Israel, Iran, and um, and that's why Israel is being preemptive now. And um, you would have heard of a bombing in Yemen recently. Yep, yep. Uh, believed to be from Israel. Now, that's pretty significant because Yemen is um, so far away from Israel, and yet a Shiite um, militia training site run by Iran, training its fighters, was actually bombed by Israel in Yemen, um, which meant that the Israeli Air Force had to fly to Yemen, more than likely over Saudi Arabia, which is keeping very, very quiet, refuel over Saudi Arabia, either in the air or on the ground, and then fly back to Israel. That's how far it is away. So there's a lot of things happening that we're not sure of, but Iran is front and centre, and um, it looks like they're preparing to um, attack Israel through their proxies. They won't attack themselves, um, but they'll use their proxies. Yeah. Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the south, um, and in Syria, their fighters in Syria as well. Yep. So that's that's the big news. And prophetically, that, that's significant because Iran is part of the Gog and Magog war that will join Russia um, in coming to attack Israel. So this is, if you like, a shadow of what is to come, a preemptive of what is to come. Yep. Um, and it's all pointing towards that, that battle. And of course, Russia and Israel are not uh, on good terms at the moment because Israel seems to be backing Ukraine in the war. Yep. And so Russia's 
stopping um, the Alia from Russia, stopping Jews returning back to Israel now yep. in Russia, shutting down the um, Jewish agency that accommodates all the Jews returning. So that means they're stopping the Jews from coming home now. So there's a lot of tensions happening in, and all the nations that are in tension are those nations involved in that Gog and Magog war. Yep. Russia, yep. Iran, and Turkey will be involved in it as well. I've had a few Christians suggest to me that um, that Russia is uh, looks like it's being almost held back or, or almost kind of inferring that they're being defeated um, in Ukraine. And uh, then I've, I've you know, gotten into discussions about, well, Russia in the long run, as you said, you know, they're, they're involved in this war. How do you mm. see things, um, you're not a war expert or anything, but biblically, how do things really have to, you know, go for Russia in the long run? I mean, can they, can they be defeated in Ukraine and still the other things play out? Or do you think biblically it would, would it make more sense that they would have the long-term victory or something? Yeah, well, look, um, like everyone else, I can only speculate. Yeah. Um, I wish I had the answer, but according to scripture, from what we understand, Russia's involved in this last Gog and Magog war. Yep. And the Bible actually says that um, God's going to put hooks in their jaws mm -hmm. and pull them down. Yep. So whether or not they're in a position at the moment or even a desire to attack Israel, yeah, they're going to be drawn into it, and I think they're going to be drawn into it simply because they're they're going to partner Iran, yep, and they're partnering Turkey, and they're part of that coalition as well. So it may not be just Russia on its own saying, "Well, let's attack," but they're going to be drawn into it, yep, because they've got interests in Syria, uh, Russian bases in Syria, which is right next door to Israel. Yep, they're making alliances now with Iran. They're actually buying drones off Iran. Yep, Iran is a major producer of drones now in the world and Russia is buying drones from Iran. Yep. And so the you can see their connection with Iran and Syria and Turkey may be the catalyst that draws them into a war. If if Iran goes to war against Israel, then Russia will probably join them. Um, yeah. And that could be that hook that God says he'll, you know, metaphorically he'll pull them and draw them down to Israel. Yeah. Part of an alliance. Um, uh and do you think um, I've heard other people speculate also about the uh, the amount of oil that Israel has found um, yeah. right on in their border uh, yeah. oil and there's that big gas deposit and yeah, gas um, deposit and also and also talk of gold um, being yeah. found, which seems strange considering it's such a small country. Um, yeah. But yeah, does so does that also all play into this this war in Ezekiel thirty eight? Do you think as well? Yeah, well, Israel apparently has enough gas to supply Europe um, mm -hmm. for for uh, for some amazing amount of time. Now, traditionally, Russia's been the big supplier of gas to Europe. Mm. But now, if Israel was able to build a pipeline into Europe, um, they could supply, technically supply Europe and cut Russia right out of it. Okay. Um, so, But the thing is, they haven't built the pipeline and it's going to cost a lot of money. Yep. And that's where Turkey comes into it because they're saying to Israel now, they've just made a renewed peace effort with Israel. They're saying, look, why don't you build a pipeline to us in Turkey because we're connected to the European lines and everything. Yeah. And we'll send it through via us to Europe. Okay. So that's the cheaper option. The other option is billions and billions and billions of undersea, you know, pipelines or liquefy it and send it down to Egypt and as yep. liquefied gas and then send it off. They're, they're exploring all these options, but look, technically, they could cut Russia right out of the um, the market. Okay. And, and countries like Germany and Italy and places like that are making deals with Israel now to get their gas supplies, bypassing Russia. So okay. that could play into it. Yeah. Russia could say, hang on, we've lost all our money now because Israel taken the gas. Let's go and take the gas, you know, or yeah. let's attack the country. It's only a small country. and. Yeah. And Iran might say, well, we'll join you. And Turkey say, well, we'll join you yep. as long as we get a slice of the pie. Yeah. Um, so that there's all these scenarios. And I think everyone that's sort of commentating on this are trying to put things together, but we just don't know. But we can see a lot of scenarios. Yeah. Happening. Okay. The other thing I noticed, uh, um, yeah, and if you, if you tell me if you agree or don't agree, but it seems like 
uh, Israel's kind of being isolated in other ways. Um, so I, I've noticed that uh, with these other attacks and things happening in Gaza, the media and other countries, I mean, you know, the United Nations always seem to be against Israel anyway. But now it's yeah. like the media just, they, they're constantly attacking. And Israel seemed to be more and more isolated. Um, you know, and, and America does no longer seems to stand with it, uh, especially after the loss of Trump and all that. Is that mm -hmm. something that has to continue, um, this oh, kind of, of isolation? Does. Is it happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course it does. Israel has always been isolated. Yep. The United Nations passes resolution after resolution against Israel mm -hmm. for every little thing, and yet it ignores human rights abuses in Korea, North Korea and, and Saudi Arabia and all that. But Israel seems to be attacked on every front. Mm. If you go and do some research with the United Nations, you'll find that nine out of 10 resolutions against the countries of the world, condemning the countries of the world, it's Israel. Yeah. Nine out of 10. Um, and yet other countries seem to escape it. Now with the US, with Biden, um, he's basically going to do a deal now with Iran. And Israel said, listen, you do a deal with Iran, this nuclear deal that they're contemplating re-signing. Yep. They said it's going to be 10 times worse than it was previous. In other words, America's just going to let Iran have their way. Yeah. Um, so Israel's lost an ally there. When they lost Trump, they've lost a real ally yeah. in the United States. Um, so this has got to continue because Israel's got to become isolated. And you, you'll understand that through Scripture when this battle of Gog and Magog does happen, no nations come to rescue Israel. It's God himself. Yeah, that actually destroys Gog and his armies on the mountains of Israel. So mm. there's no other nation standing with Israel yep. uh, to defend them. It's got to be God defending them. So this isolation, yes, it's got to continue. It's got to continue. Okay. Yeah. And get worse. <laughs> get worse. Yeah. Okay. So that's why the church, that's why we as the church, we should be the best supporters. Yeah. You know, the governments are not going to support Israel. Even mm -hmm. our Australian government now, the Labor Party, they're pushing for a two-state solution. They want the Palestinians to have their own state. I noticed that, um, yeah. Yeah, which is really a curse on us if we follow through with it because God says he'll judge those who divide his nation. Uh, Joel chapter 3, you can read that. So, yeah, um, all the nations of the world are, are pitting themselves against Israel. And the church, we should be the ones that stand up and say, no, biblically, Israel's not perfect, but, hey, they're the... They're the covenant people of God and God's got plans and purposes. And we need to stand with them and show support. Okay. So talk, speaking of the uh, the church and what we should be doing, because yes. I noticed last time and I've had it before too, whenever uh, talking about Israel and last time I spoke to you, immediately yep. I had comment um, come up, I think it was on YouTube, uh, something about uh, Israel, modern day Israel, not being the same as biblical Israel. Can you correct that or take it apart or you know why why are people well, saying like that and what is it actually well if modern israel isn't the israel of old well what is who is um when jesus comes back he's coming back to a literal physical jerusalem mm. that involves modern israel now the modern jewish person today uh they're blind spiritually they're very very blind and they're very secular um but even the Bible prophesied that when God brought the people of Israel back from the nations, yep. he said he would bring them back in blindness. They weren't coming back because they were saved or they believed in Jesus. They were coming back as atheists, um, non-believers, mm. pagans. But God says he's going to recall them and build them. So what you see today, the modern Israel is the Israel because it's the promise of God. He promised to bring them home. So, yeah, they're not the biblical Israel. But no, nothing is because that was 2,000 years ago. Yep. But they are the Israel of God because God said one day he'll bring them home yep. and he'll bring them home in unbelief. Yep. And it's only when they're in the land and they go through the persecutions they've got to go through in the future that remnant, a remnant of them will be saved. So, yes, um, you can't say that this is not the Israel of today because if it's not, well, where are the promises of God? Who are they made to? They're not made to the church. The church is not Israel. Yeah. Yes, they are pagan. Yes, they are unbelievers. Yes, they are secular. But God says he'll bring them home in the last days. And that's where he's going to refine them in the land in the last day. Yeah. And and is that that's why the church should be supporting them, because 
because the other argument I've also heard is people say, uh, like the church is the modern day um, Jerusalem or modern day Israel, this kind of spiritual Israel. Um, is that so? That's all false. That's 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 so that's a um, that's called replacement theology, mm -hmm. and that is that that's actually a blasphemy because. Um, God didn't make the promises to the church. Israel existed 1,500 years before the church was born. Mm -hmm. So how can the church be Israel? Yeah. Israel already existed 1,500 years. Um, all the covenants and all the promises were made to Israel. Yep. We've been grafted into the promises, yep. but we're not the tree. The tree is Israel. Yep. We've been grafted in. Branches were broken off. and we. So we receive all those promises and blessings of God, but we're not Israel. Okay. And and the future promises to Israel are not to the church. That's why we we understand the church will be raptured out of here before God finally finishes His plan with Israel. Yeah. So you can't say the church is Israel. We're not Israel physically, or spiritually. Um, Israel is Israel. The church is church. There's two separate identities. God has got a plan for both, and the age of the church is coming to an end very soon when God's going to take the church out of the way through the rapture, and then he's going to finish his plan that he started with Israel. Because he made promises to David that he had a descendant on that throne forever, mm -hmm. and that descendant's going to be Jesus when he comes back yep. to rule and reign on that throne, to a literal, physical Jerusalem. Okay. It's got to be Jerusalem. Okay. And that's why Jerusalem's under attack. That's why the world wants to divide it. You know, it's a spiritual problem on back of what's happening. Yeah. Okay, thanks for clearing that up, but clarifying because yeah, you always there's always so many uh, comments, and I just uh, yeah, it's frustrating. It's we've got to get back to the word of God. We've got to really get the word and let the word be our foundation. Let the word speak. Yeah. Um. Do you mind discussing some other things that, that no, I've noticed fine, lately? Yeah. Uh. So I wanted to get your thoughts on um. I don't know if you watched the Commonwealth Games, the opening ceremony, and they had this weird ceremony. I did. I did do an episode on it. My thoughts were yeah. that this this bull ceremony, um. It was it was a like a fake. It was almost um yeah like a fake pagan. Yeah. A pagan worshiping, and um I yeah. think. In the Bible, you know, it talks about that God Baal, Baal, have you pronounce it? Yeah, and it's Baal, it's a yeah. bull or a calf. And it yeah, seemed yeah. like what they were doing in the ceremony was um yeah. was almost pretending to have this pagan worship. Um yeah. am I off ball? Am I off you know, what were your thoughts? No, Did you, you see that? You've got to ask the question why. Yeah. Now, just as a bit of context to that, um, you know the Commonwealth Games was held in the English city of Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Birmingham has a, an association with the bull dating back hundreds of years, centuries. Yeah. Back in about 1100, they used to have a, it used to be an area they called the, the slaughter yard, where bulls would be baited and then slaughtered there. So that city of Birmingham has a history with the bull dating back centuries. So on that level, the reason they had the bull was to, because it's so closely associated with Birmingham. Mm -hmm. uh, it's its mascot, if you like. Yeah, yep. Um, on that sense. But on the other hand, you think, why would they get a bull? Why would they worship it? Why would they seem to be praying to it and, and praying for it? And why is a woman sitting on the bull, which is reminiscent of Revelations chapter 17, where the woman rides the beast? Yeah, okay. Although the beast in Revelation 17 had seven heads and ten horns. This was this was just a bull. Yeah. But going back to Baal, yes. Baal worship was the worship of bulls. Um, the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, remember? Yeah. They, um, in the wilderness, they made a calf to, in the form of a bull, yeah. um, which was Baal worship. So I have to ask the question, why? Okay, I can understand the association of Birmingham with the bull. Mm -hmm. And the bull's name is Perry, by the way. <laughs> um, not that it means anything, but his name's Perry. Um, but I can understand that association because they've had hundreds of years being a bull area, a slaughterhouse. But the other side, it seems like a spiritual pagan festival to me, where this, and they were, they were literally praying to it. They were raising their arms to it. They were saying convocations and prayers to it. And I'm thinking, where does that fit in? What? How is that relevant? Yeah, that is just pure paganism right there. I had a thought because, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but in Revelation it talks about 
um, like a false prophet. And it yeah. seems to me that it's describing a false religion that he yeah. brings in. And I was wondering was whether this kind of thing, because it seems so much more prevalent than it used to be, this just in your face, um, seeing people uh, kind of do these religious rituals, um, pagan rituals. And I, I was wondering whether this um, is just getting people used to that idea of this kind of weird false worship because yeah. in the in the last days in the tribulation period whether you know that's this is the kind of thing you know i think it talks about worshiping the um it doesn't say antichrist but worshiping the beast worshiping that beast. who it is the antichrist um yeah. you know is that is that what the world is trying is that the spiritual aspect who is trying to get people used to that mindset of worshiping false oh, worship I, I, I would agree 100 percent. yeah there's definitely a push to um you know, get people away from the traditional Christian view. Mm. And this seems to be part of the trend of just a pagan, everything goes sort of religion. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, you have to ask the question, why? What, what's the purpose behind it? And it's just part of the spirit of the age. You watch everything today. Christianity doesn't have a voice anymore. It's trying to be pushed to the side. And it's almost like there's this universal, just do what you feel is right, do what you think is good, everything is inclusive and i think yeah. like you're saying i agree it, it's a conditioning of the mind yeah and people accept it people wouldn't have looked at that and except if you're a christian and gone oh that's pagan oh that's you know they, yeah. they wouldn't have given it a second thought so yes there's a conditioning going on yeah and it's it's called the spirit of lawlessness which the bible says is already in the world yeah and it's going to point to the lawless one now this false prophet that's supposed to write he's going to be the head of a a religion and it's not going to be a godly religion. It's going to be something that the world accepts. And mm. he's going to head this up. Um, and he's going to point people to the beast, the Antichrist. Um, it's not the Antichrist who forces people to take the mark. It's this false prophet who tells everyone they've got to take the mark to identify with the with the beast, which is the Antichrist. Yeah. So you read that in Scripture in uh, Revelation 13. He, the false prophet, causes them all to have a mark the mark of the beast so and another thing you might be able to clarify there's also this um i think it's called the abrahamic center that's being built yep yep, yep. um and it's the mixture of the three religions yep. uh judaism christianity yep. when, when i say christianity i think it's actually roman catholicism <laughs> that's catholicism yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh and islam yeah. Um, and I was wondering, you know, is this uh, is this the false religion or I don't know? It seems weird that they've built this massive big. I think the first one's gone up in in uh, in Berlin, and then they've got others in in um in somewhere in uh, the an Arab nation somewhere. I yeah, can't remember now. Right, right. But um, you know, and there's this big push for this joined three religion kind of thing. Is that is that the kind of thing that the, this false religion? How do, how do you see this that well, kind of thing playing out? It, it's all got to come together somehow, doesn't it? Because it's yeah. all got to come under this one guy. Um, unifying thing will be this mark. And that's why I say that, you know, the things we've been through in the last couple of years are simple signs to say to everybody in every nation, you've got to conform, you've got to have this mark, you've got to have this, this jab um, to be included. And the yeah. world did. That, mm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a test run, if you like. The next time it'll be under the guise of, um, oh, we need world unity. And so you've got to identify with us through this mark, this world unity. And this is, again, a shadow of what is to come, the unifying of religions. Yeah. And, um, and you're glad, you know, I'm glad you pointed out rightly that the Christianity part of it's not true Christianity. It's got nothing to do with true Christianity. No. Christianity is a broad umbrella, unfortunately, that includes everyone and everything. Um, uh, being an ex-Catholic myself, um, you know, I know that you can accept anything as a Catholic and still be called a Catholic. So, yeah, that's this acceptance, this broad acceptance of, of unity through belief. And you can believe in what you want, but we can still be unified. Everything's the same. It's all under one. Yeah, just a, a simple shadow of what is to come. Yeah, I like your I like your analogy of the the foreshadowing, 
because I mm. think uh, when I talk to other Christians about things, I actually don't like using the phrase Christian Christians because, like you said, yeah. anyone calls themselves a, a Christian. I think Beyonce refers yeah. to herself as kind of being a, a Christian, and mate, she's yeah as anti-Christian as you can get. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but everyone thinks they're a Christian, and then they'll go out and do whatever they want. So yeah, Bible believing. Yeah, Bible following people. Bible um, obeying, yep. <laughs> yeah, Bible obeying. Um, and this, um, yeah, a lot of them don't. A lot of the ones I've spoken to don't really see the whole foreshadowing. I think they just, yeah, yeah which is a bit of a shame. Now, I think if you view what's happening in the world through the lens of what's happening is is a foreshadow of what is to happen. It's it's like you said, it's conditioning people, their minds. To think a certain way, there's a narrative now. Um, governments, you know, spread the narrative of what they want, how they want it, um, and so everything is being pushed towards this narrative. And these are test runs, shadows, trials to condition people to move in that direction. Mm. Keep pushing the sheep, as it were, towards the pen until you can get them in the pen, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if we can move. To Australia, if you don't mind, sure. and I, I obviously I'd sent you a message about what I want to talk about. And look, I have um, I've avoided uh, these talking about these two people, uh, especially the subjects, because I didn't want to uh, didn't want to overstep uh, yeah. overstep the boundaries, marks, and that. Um, but I have spoken about, and I want to talk touch a bit on Scomo, Scott Morrison, former yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, you know, and what he's done lately. And I'd, I'd, I'd voiced some concern quite a while back because in my mind, he was, um, you know, he'd some of the things he'd done during the pan pandemic uh, because, you know, he's a Christian um, saying mm -hmm. that he's a born again Christian. But then at times, and I understand politics is hard and you're, you know, trying to balance everything. But it seemed like he omitted the truth at different times. And I was always like saying to people, well, I don't know, he's, and then, and then all this other things come out about um, which you know there's nothing illegal about it. They're saying, mm -hmm. but it's it just seems like really weird behaviour. How yeah. have you had any discussions about it? Any thoughts about it? How is a Christian? Because in my mind, I think well, it doesn't. It's not a great witness. It's it's just weird. What, what, yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, when you put the name of the Lord to your life and your actions. Mm. then, of course, it's going to come under scrutiny. Yeah. Um, I Like you, I don't like to talk too much about politics because as far as I'm concerned, you can't trust any government. Yeah. It um, doesn't matter who they call themselves. Um, you know, our eyes should be on the Lord and, and on the word of the Lord and, and living to declare the, you know, the salvation of Christ. Mm. Uh, that, that's where our focus is. But you can't avoid politics, and especially yeah. when a prime minister comes out and says, yeah, I'm a Christian and... Now, I know the church he goes to in, in Sutherland in Sydney. I know the pastor, know of him. I know a bit of what he's taught. I know in a different country I was a speaker and he was a speaker and I saw some of the things which I was quite simply um, disgusted with from his pastor. So if that's the sort of teaching he's getting, I don't, um, I, <laughs> I don't doubt some of the things he's done are a bit dodgy because... I've seen it in his leadership, but um, but that's beside the point. I'll probably get in trouble for that. But anyhow, that's what I saw. Um, but, yeah, look, you've got to talk the talk and walk the walk. Yeah. Some of the things that Scamo seems to have done is betrayed his, his, his Christianity. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to judge the guy. Um, no. Being the Prime Minister would be the, one of the hardest, thankless jobs there is. Yeah. But you've got to be careful when you put the name of the Lord to things that you walk the walk and talk the talk and live the life. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen a few of his shortcomings. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. You, yeah. I, like I said, I have spoken a bit about him before and I, you know, I love talking about politics. I just more disappointed, <laughs> I think in, in stuff. And the other one, and I want to talk about this because there's been so much of an attack or what I see as an attack in the media towards Christianity and especially the Bible. The Bible's constantly yeah. attacked. And then we see things like what's happened with Hillsong and mm. and Brian Houston. Um, and, you know, I'll be straight up. I, I, I 
I was put off Hillsong a long, long time ago. I, I did go to conferences in the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, but for whatever reason, I just, yeah, I thought, no, I didn't think it was a fantastic thing, but, um, yeah. How do, how does a Christian, how do you re- reply or how do you discuss it? But honestly with like what's happening with Brian Houston at the moment. Yeah. Well, it, it is sad when a, um, a very prominent so-called Christian leader is exposed like he was, you know, with, uh, you know, with the supposed visit to the women's room and alcohol and things like that. Um, Look, like you, I was turned off Hillsong long ago because I actually opposed one of their um, introductions. And one of the introductions that they introduced into the AOG was um, was allowing their ministers to drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now, coming from a, a publican background, my father was a publican, I grew up in hotels, I was totally opposed to that. And I let the AAG know that, and they didn't like me for letting them know. Yeah. But it's come back to bite them, this policy now of allowing their ministers to drink. And even the, the top guy who was instrumental in introducing this policy um, is caught drunk. And, you know, um, so anyway, we'll leave that. But look, I think you've got to just say, look, yes, look at the Bible. Look at all the, the major players in the Bible. The Bible shows their faults. Yeah, yep. David was an adulterer. Yeah. And a murderer. Yep. Um, and God exposed him. You know, we are human. We are frail. And that's where the grace of God kicks in. Now, we can't play on that grace, but we're all frail. We're all human. We all make mistakes. But God is God and the word is the word. And that should be our highest aim. And Brian Houston's only a man like the rest of us, under a lot of pressure, obviously, with everything he's doing. He makes mistakes and he's going to be scrutinized even harder because of his prominence in society. And society will go at any opportunity they can to destroy the church. Mm. Um, that, that's Satan's plan. Strike the shepherd, the Bible says, and scatter the sheep. So he goes for these leaders. He look, this this is this is it's only what the Bible said would happen. Jesus said, if they hate me, they'll hate you. So we can't expect to be loved in the eyes of the world. or And they'll look for every little opportunity to pick and to attack. And you're going to see it, and you're going to see it more and more. Uh, you've seen it when somebody stood up like Israel Folau against, you know, the homosexual thing. And mm. he got sacked. And, you know, there was a lot of people that, in the church that didn't support him. Yep. Um, they supported the world, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're going to see that. If you if you want to be a fair dinkum, believer in god's word and practice that word you're going to come up against opposition in every part of your life so expect it uh, because jesus said it's going to happen okay and listen we've we've only got um just under four minutes left so yeah. i just wondered if you can just um just wrap up with why uh why, why it is important why you should be a christian what's the point in believing in God, if you can just, you know, in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Well, look, you know, the, the point is that um, you have a look around you and people are blind to the truth that God exists. I've had to deal with some things in the last few days, which are, it's the worst of mankind. Just the heart of man is wicked. The heart of man is evil. There's no fear of God. There's no fear of life to come. Uh, there's no thought of life to come. And so, when God gives us that opportunity, opens our eyes to, to the truth of who we are, we need to take it because it's the only way that he's going to change our lives and change our heart. And by doing that, he changes our families. He changes our circumstance. He changes those who we come in contact with. Um, that's the salt and that's the light. And there's the eternal, eternal aspect as well. You know, without Christ, no one's going to live forever in the presence of God. There's, there is a hell. People don't like talking about it, but there is a hell. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And so being a Christian, especially in this day and age, you're going to be on your own. Um, Talks about the narrow path, and there are a few that find it, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. It's easy to be a sheep and to follow everybody else, but it's so much harder to stay on that narrow way. Yeah. But that's the way that Jesus has chosen. And he offers eternal life. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit to uh, guide you and help you and strengthen you. And we're going to need it in these days because they're getting dark and Christians are going to be the subject of attack. Mm -hmm. And so to be a Christian 
is to uh, reflect the life of Christ, to enjoy life. You know, you, you can enjoy life a lot more if you know Christ because then your purpose in life is revealed. Yeah. Uh, and there is a hope and there is a future and you can go through these problems with a smile on your face. Um, so, yeah, we need it for salvation. Say Salvation from what? Salvation from our sins. Mm. Okay. Because we're all born sinners. That's awesome. Awesome news. Thanks. Uh, thanks for ending with that. And um, yeah, because, you know, we really want to explain to people why, you know, yeah. why we talk about God and this isn't just empty yeah. promises, empty words. And, uh, and there's a future and a hope, like you said, in, in Christ. And uh, listen, thanks very much again for joining us. Uh, I'm going to have the Pleasure. details for Christian friends of Israel up uh, in, in yep. the description. Um, yep. And, uh, in, in your details so anyone can contact you as well um, and support yep. Pastor Patrick Russell uh, in your ministry. And thanks again for joining me. I no, appreciate it, Jason. Thanks, mate. Good to see you again. And God bless everyone. Yeah, thank bless you. Bless you too. Thank you.